Isaiah, the 56th chapter, verses 1 through 7. Amen. Amen. I'm going to talk to us for today on a topic that honestly I think it's sad I have to preach on this. But this is something the church, quite frankly, has gotten all wrong. <laughs> And sometimes you got to preach things right. Amen. 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 you got to fix things that are broken. Right. And this is one of those messages. It's called forgiven, not fixed, pardoned, not perfected. Amen. Now listen carefully. Forgiven, not fixed, pardoned, not perfected. Amen. Isaiah 67, excuse me, 56 Verses 1 through 7. And the King James text today reads, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment, and do justice. For my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Amen. Blessed is the man that doeth this, mm -hmm. and the son of man that layeth hold on it that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. Hallelujah. Amen. Forgiven, not fixed, pardoned, not perfected. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time, King Jesus. Once again, Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of the Lord we feel in the house of God. Lord, I thank you for giving me the necessary fortitude, patience, endurance to be able to stand in this altar, in this pulpit for 20 years and minister in the city of Dallas. I've not always seen the results I'd like to see. I, I'm not thrilled, Lord, with the fruit, the harvest that we've been able to bring in. I'd love to see so much more. But Lord, you know what you're doing. And I accept your will. And I have committed myself, Lord, to doing that which you've called me to do. And at the age of eight years old, in the pew of that Pentecostal church in southern New England, you called me to preach. You didn't call me to perfection. You called me to preach. You didn't call me, Lord, to preach so long as I had an audience of thousands. You called me to preach wherever the door was open. And I've sought over all these years to preach, Lord. Whether I be invited to preach in a mega church or whether I be invited to preach in the smallest of fellowships, I've always accepted every invitation. I've sought, oh God, to do that which you've called me to do. Today, Lord, you've given me a message for the church of the living God. You've given me a message for the people of God. And I ask, Lord, right now, 
that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon the messenger of the gospel. That you would help me to deliver the word of God in a manner, Lord, that will bring fruit into the lives of God's people, that will help, Lord, that one who does not know you to find you, will help that one that's backslidden to find restoration. Let the healing virtue of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, flow out at this hour. Heal, touch, save, even as the Word of God goes forth. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. What chapter is that? Isaiah 56, 1 through 7. Mm -hmm. The promise of salvation is not a promise that people will be changed so that they might be saved, but rather it is a promise that the Lord, listen carefully to what the preacher is about to say, that the Lord would change the rules so that those who were before rejected and set aside might now be included and accepted. Hallelujah. In our primary text today, Isaiah 56, 1 through 7, the Lord speaks through the prophet Isaiah of a couple of groups of people that according to the law were rejected by God. You see, God was not interested in those who were outside of Israel. Israel was that nation he had come into covenant with through his promise to Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel. And God was committed to the people of Israel. But there were strangers, meaning immigrants, people who were not Jewish by birth, who would come into uh, Israel and they would decide they wanted to become part of the Jewish nation. They wanted to become part of the Jewish people. Just as we have people today, for instance, who can convert to Judaism, you know, they could convert to Judaism and they could attach themselves to the Lord. That's when the Lord says in our primary text today, the stranger that attaches himself to me. He literally means the immigrant who chooses to convert to Judaism. That's what he's saying. And he says, the stranger who converts to Judaism is considered slightly different. Not quite the same as the one who is born a Jew. Those who are born a Jew are one thing. Those who convert to Judaism are something different. But then he goes even further. He said, there's another group that are even more rejected, that are even less welcome in the temple and in the house of God. And that is this group of men known as eunuchs. You see, according to the law of Moses, Rose, a eunuch had no place in the temple. A eunuch could not even so much as enter into the temple. He was not allowed nor permitted to come into the temple. His body had been permanently damaged and it had been permanently altered and there was nothing that was going to change that alteration. He, once you're a eunuch, you're a eunuch. <laughs> once you castrate a cow, a cow's castrated. He ain't going to grow things back. There are, you know, these things don't regenerate themselves. Well, the same is true of a man. Once he has been rendered a eunuch, it is permanent and it is irreversible. I want you to listen to me. The promise of righteousness is not that righteousness as measured by the law would be any more attainable through human effort, but rather that faith would replace the law, thus making righteousness by faith accept, uh, accessible to all who would believe. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, the law depended upon your ability to do. 
You had to be able to follow all the rules. There were 500 plus laws within the law of Moses. And the word of God said if you were guilty in one, you were guilty of all. If you broke one of the laws, one lied. It was the same as though you were a murderer. It was the same as though you were an adulterer. It was the same. There were no there were no levels, there were no differences. You know, in the church today, they love to try to tell us that one sin is greater than another. You know, oh, they love to run around and say, well, this group over here, they're bigger sinners than this group over here. Got news for you. That's not what the Word of God teaches. Mm -hmm. Guilty of one, it's as though you're guilty of all. It's one and the same. It doesn't matter. According to the law, you had to be able to do. But according to the New Testament, New Covenant that God gave us through Jesus Christ, it is no longer incumbent upon you to do. Listen. But it's incumbent upon you to believe. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus' God. gospel, the gospel that Jesus Christ preached was not a message of sinners stop sinning. You people need to quit doing this and start doing this. You never heard him preach that. He never said that. He was constantly surrounded by publicans and sinners, and yet you never once heard the Lord engaging in a culture war. Mm -hmm. right. He never talked about the homos. He never talked about the drunks. He never talked about the prostitutes. He never talked about the whoremongers, did he? No. But what was the message of Jesus? He said, He that believeth on me, hallelujah, shall in no wise be cast out. His right. message was, Believe, because at the heart of the gospel, the truth of the matter is this. Amen. The righteousness that God one day promised through the Messiah was a righteousness that was dependent upon faith. Amen. Not our ability to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. In Matthew 9, 11 and 12, the word of God said, but he, meaning Jesus, said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. <clears throat> For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now there are certain facts related to the eunuch as we read about in our primary text today. The condition of the eunuch, number one, was permanent and irreversible. The Lord spoke in Matthew 19 of the eunuch being made, or a person being made a eunuch, in three ways. He said, one, a eunuch may be born a eunuch. So they may be born with a condition that is permanent and irreversible. Am I telling the truth? He said a eunuch may have been rendered a eunuch, <coughs> through the actions of men. So therefore, there are those who are eunuchs because another person did this to them. And they did something to them. Listen to me, you got to remember this. They did something to them that was permanent mm -hmm. and irreversible. Right. Amen. Through no fault of their own. Mm -mm. Thirdly, he said there are those eunuchs who have chosen to be eunuchs for the sake of the gospel. So therefore it is a self-act. Thus they rendered themselves a eunuch by reason of their own choice and their own means. Oh my goodness, you know, people in the church just love to try to assign blame. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, you know, growing up, I, I grew up in a fundamentalist church. <laughs> uh -huh. My grandmother always cracked me up because she, she loved to, to say certain things and she just knew that if she told people certain things that she'd get pity, you know, that they would pity her. And they'd feel sorry for her. And, 
And she thought for sure that that was the case. But you know what I learned growing up in the fundamentalist church? Uh, if you think you're going to get pity out of people telling them that my grandson is gay or my my son is an alcoholic or, or this one is a is a whoremonger, if you think you're going to get pity, honey, you couldn't be more wrong. No, in fundamentalist evangelical circles, they love to assign blame. They love to figure out, well, who's at fault for why would Sister Bell have a grandson who's gay? Hmm. I wonder what she did. I wonder what how she raised her daughter that her son had come. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh huh. I wonder what Sister Bell did that her son is an alcoholic. I wonder what Brother Jones did that his daughter is this or his son is that. Am I telling the truth? They love to assign blame. And in the Word of God, it's funny, we see an instance in which this very thing happens. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Listen, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. <laughs> Who can we blame for this, Lord? There has to be somebody to blame. This man was born blind, so it can't be his fault. So who, whose fault is it? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And we know the Lord went on to heal this man of his blindness. So why was this man born blind? Because he was born in preparation for this hour. God wanted to show the world what he was capable of. And he wanted to use this man for a testimony. And so that man was born not even knowing he was born blind for a reason. But he was born blind for a reason. It was a good reason. It was a positive reason. Hallelujah. He was going to find his... his uh, being spoken of in the pages of God's holy book one day. Amen. People always want to assign fault. They want to find who's to blame. They want to be able to blame somebody for every condition, every sin, every disability. Mm -hmm. Many today look at the <laughs> eunuch and they want to determine who is at fault for rendering this individual a eunuch. Who's at fault for this condition in this person's life, which is permanent mm -hmm. and irreversible? Yeah. Who's to blame for this? Who caused this to happen in this person's life? According to the Lord, he said, well, they may have been born that way. He said they may have been made that way by somebody. Or they may have chosen to become that way of their own will. In the end, there is no blame to assign. Mm -hmm. If a person's born that way, how in the world can you blame them for the condition? Mm -hmm. Am I telling the truth? Right. If they're born that way, well, how in the world can you blame them for it? If somebody makes them that way through no, no fault of their own, through no choice of their own, how can they be blamed for their condition? Mm -hmm. If somebody else makes a eunuch out of a man, why in the world are you going to blame the eunuch? Why are you going to stand and say, well, the Bible said, the law of Moses said, you can't enter the temple. You're unholy. You're unclean. Now, the law of Moses did say that, and he could not enter the temple. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. But are you going to stand there and judge the man that he can't come in the temple because he's evil? He, no, he's not evil. He was born that way or he was made that way. Am I telling the truth? No matter how you slice it, there's no blame to be assigned. Why must we always look for blame? Listen. Thirdly, the Lord said, if the individual may have chosen to become a eunuch of his own will, and if someone has chosen to become a eunuch of their own will, then who in the world are we to stand in judgment of their choices and their decisions for themselves? Right. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. 
in wording it this way and speaking of them doing so for the kingdom of heaven's sake he makes clear that the decision is made by the individual in an effort to make themselves more available to the Lord and more able to selflessly work on behalf of the kingdom of God uh -huh. Not everybody can make that commitment. When I started out in ministry years ago, I was single. I didn't have a wife, didn't have family. Starting my first church and my second church, uh, well, my first church especially, was pretty easy because I didn't have to worry about a wife, didn't have to worry about kids. I, you know, if I wanted to have uh, special services or do something, I could do it. I, I didn't have to, I didn't have any conflicting schedules, you know. I didn't have a kid that I needed to go see his school play. I didn't have a wife I had to worry about, you know, uh, needing me that day for something else. No, a single man without the uh, obligations of family, without the obligations of a spouse is much more free to do the work of God and much more able to do without any constraints. And believe me, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing in many levels. The Lord taught, excuse me, the Apostle Paul talked about this in the epistles. He talked about how it's a good thing to be single and free so that you can do the work of God without constraints. But then the Apostle Paul also said, but to be able to do this is a gift. He said that not everybody has this gift. So as good as it is to be able to do the work of God as a single individual without family, without a marriage, without any form of relationship, as good as that is, it's not always possible because not everybody has that gift. Am I telling the truth? Amen. The Apostle Paul made it clear. He said, this is a, you know, the Catholic Church makes priests sign on to celibacy. But you know what? That's not scriptural. The Apostle Paul said, not everybody has this gift. Not everybody can do this. And it's actually quite torturous and quite unfair to force it upon people. One of the most damnable doctrines ever created by men within the church is the notion that once we have believed the gospel, we are somehow supposed to be transported from our frail, sinful human nature into some divine state of sinless perfection. How many times have you heard preachers, or how many times have you heard songs, gospel songs, that suggest, oh, once you believe, everything becomes perfect. Once you become a child of God, everything's wonderful. Oh, all of a sudden the sky is blue and birds are singing and everything. Oh, he fixed everything. He made everything all right. Got news for you, children. That is a lie. That is not scriptural. That is not biblical. The same troubles you had when you came into the church before you went to the altar. When you get up from the altar and go home, those same troubles are going to be home to meet you. Am I telling the truth? You're still living in the same world. You're still the same person. Yet the Bible said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Former things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. What becomes new? Because I got news for you. I went to the altar with brown hair and brown eyes, and I came up from the altar with brown hair and brown eyes. So obviously the scripture wasn't saying everything becomes new. Oh, wait a minute. How many people you know? Oh, that queer person, bless God, they went down the altar. They should have gotten up straight. Hallelujah, glory to God. If they went to that altar queer, they should have gotten up straight. Really? Yeah, because the Bible said all things become new. Uh, yeah, it does. It says all things. So if we're going to talk your language, then let's be truthful about it. Did your hair change color? Did your eyes change color? Did you go down skinny and come up fat? Did you go down fat and come up skinny? No, there are many things that don't change. What changes? What changes is not on the outside. What changes is what's on the inside. Now as a believer, everything is new to you. Right, amen. Oh my God. The way you see everything is different. Mm -hmm. Because now embracing faith in God, now 
Knowledge, you're looking at everything through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh my goodness. Now there are a lot of people who go down to the altar. Maybe they're moved by emotion. Maybe the preacher get, you know, puts them through one of those emotional uh, <laughs> guilt fests, which yeah. I hate. Yeah. Bless God, the Lord may come tonight. Hallelujah. And you're going to find yourself in the devil's hell. If, and you know, they put this big, thick guilt trip on people. And they come down to the altar because they don't want to burn in hell. They come down to the altar and they slobber and they crowd over the altar. And then they get up and they go home. And it takes about 10 minutes. And guess what? They're right back to doing everything the same way they did it before they went to the altar. Right. Because the truth is, when you're converted, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. everything doesn't change. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, a lot of things aren't going to change, listen to me children, unless you made a commitment to change Thank it. You. Oh my goodness. You see, that's where things change. Because our heart now, believing on God, now we've made a commitment. Lord, if there are things in my life that I can change, that are uh, things that displease you, or things that might you know, compromise my testimony, that might not allow me to shine brightly in the midst of an unbelieving world, then help me, Lord, to change those things. But there are still going to be things in your life like the eunuch, that are permanent and irreversible. Mm -hmm. There's still going to be things. Rose, got news for you. I was forgiven. I wasn't fixed. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah, our primary chapter, our primary text today, the Lord promised to receive the eunuch. Mm -hmm. He didn't <laughs> promise to fix the eunuch. No. Right. Right. Amen. He didn't say he was going to heal the eunuch. Mm -mm. He didn't say, I'll restore to the eunuch what was taken away from him. No, he didn't say no, that. He, didn't. he said, but I'll receive him. Hallelujah. Amen. So even though he is still <laughs> in this position that is permanent and irreversible, even though that still is his state, Amen. God says, I'll receive him. And not only will I receive him, but I'm going to give him a name that's better than that of a son. Hallelujah. He said, I'm not only going to receive that one with the permanent irreversible condition in their life. He said, not only am I going to receive them. He said, but man, I'm going to elevate them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to allow them to experience things that even a son doesn't experience. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, the wonderful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is not that God changes us into some kind of a perfect sinless being, but rather it is that God is willing to love us and extend His grace to us and allow us to be part of His family. Nobody's perfect. Amen. In spite of us. Right. Oh, hallelujah. We're not in spite of our imperfection, in spite of our faults and our failing, we ought to come into the house of God and dance a little and shout a little, not because we're holy in the eyes of God, but rather because a holy God sees us as worthy. Amen. Right. Oh, my God. Woo, children, I want to tell you. This gets me excited a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. My Lord, the vast majority of Christians never experience this so-called sinless perfection during the course of their entire Christian walk. The majority of believers walk around in a constant state of condemnation and guilt, mm -hmm. always yeah. feeling that they have fallen short of God's expectations for them. Yeah. And therefore, they are yeah. disqualified for heaven. But the truth is that our faith is the means whereby we access true righteousness. And in spite of our failings, our faults, our sin. We remain the children of God Amen. by faith. Amen. Our primary goal and objective is not to achieve some level of sinless perfection, but rather to walk in and 
and maintain our faith. Amen. The enemy loves to make people believe uh -huh. that their trip-ups, their failings, is going to cost them their salvation. Mm -hmm. He loves to make people believe that. He knows that people who believe this way most often will give up on their faith and abandon their walk with God altogether. Mm -hmm. His true and real objective is to convince us to abandon our faith. Mm -hmm. He's not just trying to get us to act in a way that we ought not to act or to do things we ought not to do or say things we ought not to say. No, 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 no. That's a means to an end. He knows that if He can help you to do something you ought not to have done or say something you ought not to have said, that He then can convince you, well, you missed the mark now. There's no heaven for you. You might as well give up not even try believing God. Not even try living for the Lord. And I tell the truth Amen. today. That's His ultimate goal. He knows the grace of God is more than adequate for our every weakness and our every failure. But can we maintain yeah. The necessary faith right. to believe this for ourselves. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, the Apostle Paul writes, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, given to me, a born in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. Nowhere in this exchange between Paul and the Lord did the Lord ever promise Paul that he would fix him. Rather, the Lord admonished Paul to simply lean on his grace as it was the strength of his grace that would see Paul through, not the strength of Paul's ability to overcome the vexation. Oh my goodness. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, Amen. lest any man should boast. As believers today, we must learn to accept the most fundamental truth of salvation, and that is the grace of God will see us through to the end. Amen. Not our ability to change or even our ability to be changed by God. Amen. The Lord knows that the only change that could ever guarantee that we would never again have to be visited by sin is the change that will occur on resurrection morning. So, yeah. until then... We simply must hold fast to our faith so as to secure a place in the promised resurrection. Hallelujah. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57, the Word of God states, Behold, Paul said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Change. There's the change that we all have been talking about. There's the change we're all waiting for. It doesn't come at conversion. It comes at resurrection. Yes. At conversion comes a commitment to hold our faith. Hallelujah. Yes. But at resurrection, the change is made a reality. Paul continues in verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be 
changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. You see, if you're looking for somebody perfect, then you're looking in the wrong place, because God news for you. I'm not perfect. Nobody when is. I came to Jesus, He didn't fix me. He forgave me. Amen. Amen. My Lord. He didn't perfect me. He pardoned me. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. He made it so that on resurrection morning, I'll be on the roll and I'll be counted worthy to be gathered up unto Him. And when that happens, then the change really comes. Amen. Then I'll be sinless. Then I'll be perfect. Then I'll be in a state of existence so that sin can no longer touch me. It can no longer bother me. I'll no longer be tempted by sin. None of the debauchery of this earth will ever again be known by those of us who believe the gospel and have accepted the word of the Lord. Am I telling the truth? Amen. But you know what, Rose? Even Him changing us wouldn't be enough. Mm -hmm. to guarantee that we'd never be visited by sin again. Oh, now I got your attention. Now yeah. some of y'all are saying, wait a minute, preacher, <laughs> what are you saying? Listen, listen to me. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Yeah. And there was no more sea. Mm -hmm. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Amen. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Mm -hmm. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. <sighs> Listen to me, children. Mm -hmm. Eternity will be very different than the life we've known on this earth. Yeah. Not merely because we will have been changed, but listen, but the Lord has promised that he's going to change everything. Amen. around us mm -hmm. as well. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh my goodness. In order for us not to know sin, in order for us not to know the things of this world again, then there, not only does God have to change us, but He's got to change this world. <laughs> you hear what I'm telling you now? Right. So He said, fine, listen, this is what I'm doing for you all. Not only am I going to change you, but I'm going to change everything around you. Hallelujah! Amen. So that everything is going to be of such a nature that you'll never sin. You'll never step outside of my will. You'll never step outside of the Spirit. You'll always do those things which are good and are pleasant. Amen. Oh my goodness. Isn't that exciting to know? That's why the Word of God says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. It doesn't say, For God so loved humanity. No, it said, For God so loved the world. 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life Amen. God literally Jesus went to the cross so that the world could be saved Amen. not just the people that live on it right Amen oh my goodness and one day we're going to be changed. And one day, the world around us is going to be changed. He right. said, a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, my goodness. He says, I'm going to do a complete renovation. I'm going to make everything brand new. Hallelujah. The entire earth is going to be restored to the <clears throat> state and the likeness of the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. The Garden of Eden is not going to be the rose, one little spot on the planet. The entire planet is going to be like the Garden of Eden was in the beginning. So don't fear today, believer, that you have not been fixed. You're a broken vessel which the Lord has received and accepted. Your permanent, irreversible situation doesn't bother him. He said, I can take somebody that the law said has no place and give them a place better than that of a son. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, he's found a way to still be able to use us, broken though we may be. He asks only that we put our faith in his grace and in so doing, embrace his righteousness by faith until that righteousness for which we today believe is realized in reality in the resurrection. Amen. Today we may be forgiven, not fixed, pardoned, not perfected, but the day is soon coming when we shall be both fixed and perfected. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. And that's the good news. Yes. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Glory to God.